perfect. So let's go through a few basic uh, rules for today. Housekeeping tips, we shall call them. Um, first of all, if uh, you don't know how to mute or unmute yourselves, um, you have several options. If you're connecting through your computer, you can use the little icon that looks like a microphone. When it's green, you're on air. When it's grayed, you are muted. So we're looking for muted for now, and you might want to unmute yourselves when it's the Q&A time. Uh, if you're calling on your phone, you can either use the mute unmute button or you can use the star six um, um, dial on your keypad. Um, you can see on my screen right now the uh, numbers that you can use should your connection not work. You have access to the sound on, of this presentation via phone as well. Welcome, whoever joined us. I can hear a bit of feedback, so I'm going to mute you. Perfect. Um, if throughout the presentation you're experiencing some issues, if it's a connectivity issue, uh, the internet is a bit lagging, the simplest way to go about it is to close your window, close everything, start over again, join us again. Um, if you're experiencing some sound issues, such as a feedback, strange echo, you know, muffled sound, it could be us. <laughs> so let us know. There's a chat box. You can let us know through the chat box and we'll try to uh, fix that. A few more things. Um, after our presenters are done talking, we will have a short Q&A. This is going to be about 15 minutes. Um, you can ask your questions out loud, or you can ask them by typing them in the chat box. Feel free to type your questions at any point throughout the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. That way, we can get through them um, as soon as we get to the Q&A. And once again, if you can't stay until the end today, that's all right. We're recording this presentation, and we'll upload it to our website site later today. Okay, before we go any further, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I live and work is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Squamish, uh, Musqueam, and Slovotooth nation nations. And um, finally, if you're joining us for the first time today, this is a webinar that has um, a connection that is um, a part of a project called Increasing Access to Justice for Older Adult Victims of Sexual Assault, a Capacity Building Approach. It was funded, or it is funded, by the Justice Canada Victims Fund, and you can find more details about the project and the resources we are uh, putting together on our website, cnpa.ca. Um, so feel free to check it out when we are done today. Okay, so I'm going to introduce our presenters today. We'll start with Laura. Laura Proctor is currently the Central East Regional Elder Abuse Consultant for Elder Abuse Ontario. She's worked in the field of elder abuse and victim services for over 15 years. In her current position, she provides frontline training and public education and collaborates with local, provincial and national stakeholders to enhance the response to elder abuse. Uh, Laura consults with seniors, families, agencies on elder abuse cases. She's previously worked for victim services and was a member of the Edmonton Elder Abuse Intervention Team, where she provided direct intervention and supports for victims of elder abuse in collaboration with the Edmonton Police Services. If you are looking to connect with Laura or with Elder Abuse uh, Prevention Ontario, I've included the links to their social media handles. I've also included the number of the senior safety line um, should you need it or want to share it. Um, next, we have Detective Staff Surgeon Tracy Bernartix. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. I tried hard to rehearse. Um, Tracy has been uh, with the Ontario Provincial Police for 18 years, and she's currently the Central Region Lead for the Victim Response Support Unit. unit. Um, she's working to add value to sexual assault investigations through oversight, victim support, and working with community agencies who support victims and survivors of sexual assault. Um, her contact information is at the bottom of this slide. And we have also Detective Inspector Karen Ernie joining us today, uh, who has been a member of the OPP since 1992 and is currently the manager of the Victim Response Support Unit. The unit, as you will hear today, provides support and expertise for sexual assault investigations throughout the province. 
Um, Karen has held positions in sexual assault, abuse issues, crime, crime units, and was a member of the major investigation support team, along with various other investigative units throughout her career. So in 2007, she trained and was certified as a criminal profiler and then became the manager of the criminal behavior analysis unit until she was promoted to inspector in 2016, which is, we've got quite the experts today and I'm very excited for this presentation. So without further ado, I guess, uh, Laura, I will make you the presenter and let you take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, Benedict. I am just trying to share my screen right now. Okay, just bear with me. Am I sharing my screen currently? Not no. just yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you should be able to uh, find a the button that says show my screen uh, towards the top of your control panel. Okay, I'm seeing the screen. It's just not allowing me to click share. It's only huh. allowing me to cancel, which I do not want to do. <laughs> Benedict, just so you know, mine as well. It'll just share my webcam. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's always how those things go. Okay, so let's uh, let's start over. Um, Laura, can you make me the presenter again, and I'll just share my screen, and maybe I can just move the slides for you. Yeah, and it'll be it'll be, be very obvious when I'm done with one slide and move on to the next, okay. Benedict. Yep. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Oh, it seems as though I am still the presenter. Yep. Can you make me the presenter? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, I can take it. Uh, I can take it from you. Um, I can my be apologies. The boss. I can be the boss of your screen. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. I love when you're the boss of my screen. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I think it's really imperative that we talk about this uh, crucial topic that rarely gets discussed uh, within society. I feel there's a great importance on shining a light uh, on the reality that older adults do become victims of sexual assaults and that they do face different barriers than other segments of the population. Uh, before we discuss the vital role of poli the, that police play in investigating and interviewing sexual assault cases of older adults, I wanted to take this opportunity to first define sexual assault, look at the prevalence of elder abuse and in particular sexual assaults of our older adults. Uh, we're going to look this afternoon at barriers in disclosing sexual assaults, risk factors and resources. So sexual assault defined, uh, sexual assault in the sexual nature that violates the sexual integrity of the victim. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada held that the act of sexual assault does not depend solely on contact with a specific part of the human body, but rather the act of the sexual nature that violates the sexual integrity of the victim. Uh, so the best way to view sexual assaults of older adults is uh, is looking at it as a continuum a continuum of hands off to hands on behaviors and some of those examples uh, from hands off to hands on would be inappropriate or harassing sexual comments or jokes, uh, forcing the victim to listen, uh, engage or discuss uh, sexualized activities. Uh, taking explicit uh, photos and videos and sharing them online without the victim's uh, consent, right up to hands-on uh, sexual assaults of forced vaginal penetration, fondling, forced oral sex, um, coerced nudity, and forced penetration. I think it's important that we highlight that when officers are investigating a sexual assault, uh, there's a certain um, and very relevant factors that they need to consider when investigating. Uh, they want to. They need to look at the part of the body that was touched, the nature of the contact, the situation in which that contact occurred, the words and gestures that were accompanying the assault, and other circumstances surrounding the act, so uh, such as the environment, uh, those type of things. Uh, we also need to look at the fact that the victim of sexual assault can, of course, be a man or a woman. And the attacker or abuser uh, can be the same sex of the vi victim, 
And very rarely do we look at the fact that a spouse may be charged with sexual assault upon the other spouse. Uh, what we do know about sexual assaults in seniors is that uh, sexual assaults is not, not just about sex. Um, sexual abuse is related to systems of power imbalance, and it's about the perpetrator existing power over the weaker individual. Like all forms of abuse throughout the lifespan, it's all about power and control. So we're going to look at the prevalence of elder abuse. Uh, whenever I talk about elder abuse in general, uh, we know that elder abuse is highly uh, underreported uh, throughout Canada. Uh, so we always do use the stat that 10% of seniors are victims of abuse. Uh, like many victims, uh, they don't always uh, identify as being a victim. And occurring, according to the World Health Organization, um, it, it truly is a hidden problem and it can affect uh, one in six older adults worldwide have reported abuse in the past year. So we'll break this down into the prevalence of actual sexual assaults. Uh, when we look at these numbers, um, I think it, it's also important to highlight, uh, just as with general elder abuse, uh, sexual assaults and sexual abuse um, are largely um, underreported, especially if the abuser is um, an intimate partner, so your spouse, uh, your common law partner, or a family member. Uh, women are at higher risk of being sexually assaulted. So women are three to four times more likely to experience sexual abuse um, versus men. And um, according to the World Health Organization, one in seven married women have reported to, be, um, to have been forced to have sex with their spouse or their partner. So current sexual assault um, rates within uh, Canada sits at about 1.6. Uh, we know since it's so largely uh, underreported for many factors that we can usually double or triple uh, any stats that I'm giving. Uh, so that 1.6 looks at about, um, um, you know, it, it could be up to 5% of the senior population. So there's many barriers in uh, reporting uh, sexual assaults. Um, the thing with the barriers that affect our older adult population is that uh, there are different barriers um, uh, from reporting than uh, younger populations face. Um, it's important to consider uh, the barriers that older adults face in reporting or disclosing sexual abuse um, and why they may not be seeking help. There's numerous reasons why older victims choose not to report their victimization to police especially if the perpetrator is a family member or they have a very close intimate relationship with the individual. Sexual abuse in older adults is underreported. Uh, the barriers um, in effectively disclosing um, the incidences are, um, we're gonna take a closer look at exactly what they are, is that fear of retaliation. Um, they're afraid of what the abuser is gonna do if they report the abuse. A lot of the times with our seniors, they also have a high dependence on the abuser for basic necessities, uh, healthcare, clothing, shelter. Um, a lot of the times our victims are afraid. Uh, they're afraid or they've been threatened to be put in an institution, um, such as long-term care or retirement home. Uh, because it's such a, a personal um, a violation when somebody's been sexually assaulted, a lot of the times um, a big barrier is embarrassment. Um, they're embarrassed uh, telling any family member or caregiver uh, that, that they are being harmed by a caregiver or family. Uh, feelings of um, power, powerlessness or hopelessness, um, especially when the individual has been in an abusive and controlling relationship for many years. A lot of the times our seniors face uh, health complications, so they're unable to communicate. That can either be due to language barriers or of course health and illness such as dementia or aphasia. They also believe that police or social service agencies um, might not be able to help them. So that's a big barrier for them. They don't realize what resources or supports there are out there. A lot of our seniors also lack understanding about their legal options or the justice system here in Canada. Uh, seniors also are unaware that abuse is occurring uh, within their lives or within their environment. Uh, they tend to uh, when you live in a uh, very abusive environment for 30, 40 years, um, you tend to normalize it. 
And then uh, the last uh, major barrier is not familiar of, of where to go. We see this a lot in uh, new immigrant populations where they just don't know where to turn for help. So we're gonna look at uh, some certain uh, risk factors um, associating, um, associated with aging that increases the older adult's vulnerability to being sexually assaulted or sexually abused. Um, it, can it can impede their ability to defend themselves. Um, individuals uh, with cognitive impairments are at the highest risk of being abused. Um, and this can be um, in relation to um, age-related illnesses, um, dementia, aphasia, strokes. Uh, many survivors, even with cognitive, um, uh, cognitive impairments, very mild cognitive impairments, may not be able to recall or describe exact events that occurred during assault, which can really um, messy the pot for police when they're investigating. Uh, so we'll look at the risk factors. The interesting um, thing with risk factors for not only the abuser, but for the older adult or the victim is that uh, you'll see here that many of the risk factors um, mirror one another. Uh, so some risk factors for the abusers is a uh, history of mental health issues, whether they're uh, diagnosed or undiagnosed, a uh, caregiver burden or burden or burnout, dependence on the victim. A lot of times you see that codependency between the older adult and the ab abuser. A lot of times you're seeing su substance misuse or abuse, uh, problems coping, and then current relationship problems or mar marital breakdowns. Uh, for our older adults, we do know that the number one risk factor is a uh, history of family violence um, experienced prior to the age of 60, more likely a history of childhood abuse. Uh, suffering cognitive impairments or dementia um, is, a, is a huge risk factor for our senior population. Uh, same with the abusers, the, the uh, mental health issues, physical frailty, we do know that if you're dependent on somebody uh, for your activities of daily living, it does put you at um, a higher risk for abuse. Um, isolation, um, substance misuse or abuse, again, problems with coping, uh, relationship problems, family problems. And then uh, we do know that older adults who are immigrants, uh, newcomers to Canada are at a higher risk factor for suffering abuse. So we will look at some resources. Um, as Benedict had said at the start of the webinar that uh, the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse has just released um, a wonderful fact sheet um, on uh, sexual abuse later in life. So I recommend downloading that. There is uh, Canadian wide resources within the fact sheet. Uh, but for those of you in Ontario and of, of course across Canada, you're more than welcome to use uh, what you're seeing here on your screen as the uh, sexual abuse decision tree. Um, it's, it's really helpful for service providers uh, to make decisions. It also includes the mandatory reporting in long-term care and retirement homes. Um, and you can also download a, a better looking copy than you're seeing today at our, our website. And um, you can see here, it will give you um, a step-by-step -step guide uh, with Ontario what to do. Um, especially if the individual is unable to uh, consent or have the capacity to make those decisions. And it gets into the POA and the substitute decision maker. So wonderful resource. And I will pass it off to my police partners uh, to discuss um, the police uh, uh, role in investigation of, of these sexual assaults. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Okay, Tracy, let's try to make you presenter and see what happens. Perfect, and we can even see you. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. okay. And am I sharing my screen? You are, but we just need to see the presentation. Okay. One second. You to move stuff around. This is the luxury of having three screens. <laughs> How's that? If you can, yes, perfect. Looks great. Okay, great, good. Um, can you still see us as well then? Because we can't see ourselves. <laughs> yes, we can see you just right. You look great, ladies. I'll let Karen take it away from here. 
be before we uh, before we uh, be silly here we want to make sure you can see us <laughs> so you can see me okay yes we can okay great thank you so hello everyone and thank you so much i'm very excited this is my first actual webinar so it's kind of bizarre to me so bear with us but uh, I just wanted to give you an overview of our unit and uh, what's been going on with the OPP when it comes to sex assault. Uh, so do I? Oh, okay, trolling. Steering the ship. I am steering the ship. Oh, nice. Okay. So just to give you a bit of background on how our unit started, I don't know if anybody remembers, but um, back in 2017, in February 2017, the Globe and Mail published um, a feature report regarding the investigation and outcome of sexual assault allegations that were reported to police agencies across Canada. So what they did was there was a freedom of information request made to several police agencies. And as a result, a report came out about high unfounded rates um, throughout Canadian police services. So this made the OPP kind of go, huh, are we one of those? And uh, we were. So the OPP commissioner, back then it was Vince Hawks, took this very, very seriously uh, and immediately asked that we do a review of our sexual assaults. So it did begin with a data classification review because initially we just thought maybe we were classifying our um our sexual assault improperly and when i say classify um just just for those of you who don't know when you report an incident you know we put the incident on our system and then we clear it in some fashion whether we clear it by charge whether we clear it if the victim declines to proceed or it was kind of a catch-all we cleared it to unfounded when we really had no other choice because we didn't have a lot of choices uh prior to last september so the data review looked at 16,000 cases and we found that about, um, I guess there was about 1,200 or, 1200 or so of those that uh, were classified improperly, that could have been classified differently. And when I use the term unfounded too, the actual definition of unfounded is after a police investigation, it is concluded that no violation of the law took place nor was attempted. So we could certainly see how victims would think that, oh, police don't believe me, my case is unfounded. But that really wasn't the case in a lot of instances. It was just we didn't have any other way to classify it. So as the classification review unfolded, we uh, noticed maybe that we could look at, we should be looking at how we investigate sex assaults. And I was part of the investigative review team. So what we did is we took, um, of all of those 16,000 cases, we, we, um, we brought it down to about 600. And we really, we reviewed every case in totality, the interviews, the notes, like literally everything. Um, and we did find quite a few flaws. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, so there, we actually ended up making a recommendation to the commissioner saying, you know, here are some of the things that we're seeing. We were seeing not the best interviewing, just no trauma informed interviewing, um, just lack of interviewing. In some parties weren't being interviewed, lack of old fashioned police work canvases. Um, improper use of technology, not inter not uh, videoing the interviews, report writing skills lacked a little bit of um, professionalism, a lot of editorial comments. And we noticed there was definitely a lack of ability with our officers to deal with the vulnerable population, whether it was children, elderly, uh, persons with disabilities, we, we fell short there as well. So once we handed that report back over to the commissioner, um, it, was, it took about seven, eight months to complete the review. He, um, he said, we need to do something about it. So we created a victim response support strategy, which I'll, I'll briefly go over with you. Uh, but in turn, we also created our unit, which is the victim response support unit. So within the province, we have, I, I was lucky enough to actually get the job, thankfully. Um, it got me off night shifts. 
it's weird when you're presenting because you can't see if anybody's going to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyways, and then we had five regional staff sergeants. So our, our province is split up in five regions. And so uh, London has um, staff sergeants, Tracy here is in central region in Aurelia. We have Dana in northwest region, Elizabeth in east region in Smith Falls, and we have Joe in northeast region looking after North Bay and all of the northeast. So these staff sergeants are the leads and um, they provide consultation and guidance to all of the sex assault investigations and do a lot of training and uh, they, they do a lot and I love them. <laughs> um, so, and so I'm just gonna get into the strategy of it. I'm just trying to figure out this technology here. So I'm like, um, also unlike other police agencies, the OPP didn't actually have one sexual assault unit. You know, you hear of Toronto Police and have sex crimes. Um, the OPP didn't have a provincial unit just because of our geography. We all, we had, we have crime unit members all over the province who do investigate uh, sex assaults, but it's not their sole responsibility. So it was nice to have a unit that was dedicated just to sex assaults. So the strategy that we did come up with is based on three pillars, victim support, uh, investigative excellence, and oversight. And um, if, if anybody wants a copy of the victim response support strategy, it's public. I don't mind sharing at all, and it goes through everything in depth. So please uh, let Benedict or myself know, and we'd be happy to, we'd be happy to share that with you. But just going into some of the um, highlights of the victim strategy, the big one of the big pieces obviously is victim support. So how do we better support our victims? Um, we really know we've noticed that we need to create more responsive, uh, informed officers. They really do need more training. And just because of just by virtue of our elderly police officers, we have a, a constant turn turnover. So we, we're always getting younger officers and the need for training is um, it's huge. So we're always trying to run some training. Um, so we do recognize that our officers need more training and we are trying to really, um, really train them in the proper trauma informed response, neurobiology of trauma, and really to treat vi victims with dignity and respect. Um, we have um, we also do training in Victim Bill of Rights and interviewing how to properly interview without victim blaming, without myths, you know, the myths and stereotypes and biases and really bring everything home. So we have created some really good training in order to help our officers support victims. Um, we are also, part of victim support too, is we are also very focused on establishing relationships with our community partners because they also know more than we do sometimes what the victims need and require, what victims need to be supported. So it's really good to have that relationship with them and to have joint training with them and awareness initiatives. Uh, and that seems to be working really well. We're getting a lot, we have a lot of great partners and doing a lot of great initiatives and, and training with our partners. Um, we're also actually in the middle of, um, well, we're looking at online reporting, anonymous reporting, third party reporting again, just to try and support our victims and help them if they want to report in different different ways other than the traditional uh, police call, the 911 call. So that is gonna be really something really good for victims. And we're also hopefully in January launching on our website, a victim's guide for um, all victims, not just of sex assault, but primarily of sex assault, but victims of crime in general as well. And then our, our, uh, just to move on to our next pillar is investigative excellence. So how do we get our officers to really respond well and investigate sexual assault properly? Um, our, as I mentioned, our team consults regularly on a daily basis with sex assault investigators, ensuring that they're done properly and in a timely manner. Um, again, it's it kind of, they all fall into each other because it's all about, seems to be all about training right now, really getting that training out. So we have developed the trauma-informed training that we are spreading across the province, but we've also assisted in revamping the sexual assault training, the uh, supervisor's course, so supervisors know how to supervise a sexual assault investigation. We're doing e-learns, um, you know, everything we can to just try and get the word out about neurobiology, about trauma, um, about really supporting the victims. 
Um, data integrity is another thing too that we're really focused on because when we look at our data, uh, like the unfounded rate, it, it seemed to be kind of very high, but it, but it wasn't really reflective of what we were doing. So I mean, and accurate data, as you know, really drives um, drives policy and drives how we can best serve our victims. So we're tr we've set up a working group to look at the data and the trends and uh, working at that as well. Um, next and the last pillar, which is probably I think our most exciting pillar, is our oversight and accountability. Uh, so we recognize that because we're launching the strategy that this was a perfect time to um, add some oversight and accountability to our officers and to our sex assault investigations. So uh, we developed different mechanisms. Um, again, all of our um, all of our staff, our staff sergeants. We do have, I forgot to mention earlier, but we do have VL victim liaison officers in each detachment that are um, kind of upskilled and trained to deal with, better deal with different sex assaults and that can help others in on their platoons. Um, so we, um, so they also provide oversight and we have, uh, so as much as we have internal oversight, we have external oversight and we have five regional collaborative review committees. That's a mouthful to say. So from now on, I'm going to call, say, call them RCRCs or committees, but we have five of them again, uh, one in each region. So five across the province. And what they do is they meet monthly in each region. They're comprised of various stakeholders from um, their sex assault advocates, Elder Abuse Ontario. We do call on Laura. She's part of our Laura Proctor that you just heard of from. She's part of our central region team. Uh, VWAP, which is our Victim Witness Assistance Program people, Indigenous Social Services, Mental Health Agencies, um, Children's Aid. So all the different community members, and they actually vary from community to community. But we uh, once a month they come to our um, our buildings and we go over cases. And so we randomly select 10 cases a month, not just the unfounded because now our unfounded rate is going down, but we really wanna make sure that all of the sex assaults are done well. So we go through randomly selected sexual assault cases and we get the input from our community stakeholders. Um, it, basically the committee reviews everything in totality and they provide feedback on not just the case that is before them, but on the overarching issues that they see, you know, more trauma-informed training, how we're victim blaming, um, all kinds of things have come out of these meetings. And, uh, and just so you know, when I say random, I really mean random. It's not police trying to hide, hide our bad cases and showcase our good cases. That's definitely not the case because we're as surprised as they are when we review the cases. Um, so the work with the committees has been incredible. It's really strengthened our partnerships within the community. And, um, and that's leveraging how we write our new policy, how we you know, prepare our training and deliver our training. And it's been really fantastic. Um, so that's kind of our overview of our oversight and accountability. We do have a governance committee that, um, that we're just starting to, just starting to build that's basically we're going to take these large overarching recommendations to our command staff to say you know we need help with these in these areas whether it's training whether it's policy whatever so um really some good oversight uh now for the police which is really great and um i think that's it for me i'm going to pass this on to tracy now and thank you very much Okay, um, so <clears throat> how, do the, how do we actually respond to reports of sexual violence involving vulnerable key persons? Um, and I'm going to cover off what we do, how we do it, and the different routes that can be taken um, to uh, support those uh, aging populations. Um, so the initial response for the OPP, and I'm only speaking on behalf of the Ontario Fringe Police and how we respond, it'll be different probably with every agency, but for us here, the uniform response is the initial response. So the call will come in, the uniform officer will respond, 
And we are working on those frontline responders with training, awareness of trauma, as Karen mentioned, um, just uh, biases and stereotypes is another big one that we're trying to teach on. Um, and just to uh, be active listening when you go to these types of calls. Uh, and then understanding that you have to be mindful of collection of evidence and if there's something that you need to get right away or if that's something that it can wait and kind of the best the best practice would be for trauma victims to wait. So we're trying to teach that to the frontline officers who are responding. Um, and the next thing too is to engage if there is an actual crime that was committed, if they do their initial response and determine that a crime was committed, that they engage with the staff in a home uh, or the support people of the victim and make sure that they're engaged with them to figure out what the best uh, avenue would be. Um, referral to victim services in Ontario so that they can have their emotional support as well as outreach to other resources in the community. Um, and then from there, they would then refer it to a trained sexual assault investigator. So that would be our crime units um, to be able to do these very um, fragile investigations and do a really thorough and uh, good job. If there has been no criminal offense committed and yet we're called believing that there is, uh, we still could make them a uh, referral to victim support, um, sorry, victim services for the community supports, engage with the staff and the care people and the medical professionals as well, and just make sure that we do a wholesome response um, and then as well, on top of that, we also have our, some of our detachments in Ontario have mental health response units. And they are also, um, some of them partnered with crisis workers that will, can go at any time. And so if the officer feels that that's more appropriate to engage them to continue on the path to helping them, that's what they'll do. So, um, so then moving on, if it was a criminal offense that was committed, to talk about some investigate the investigators' considerations. So things that they have to be mindful of. So as I said, they, we have a sexual assault investigators course in the province of Ontario for all police, every agency. Uh, and in that is uh, trauma awareness and understanding the effects of trauma, the neurobiology science of it, um, recognizing biases, so ageism, uh, not valuing, obviously um, not valued at the people who are not valued as trustworthy human beings in that that comes into play, your own bias and checking those at the door um, and understanding that we need to treat them as we would any of our loved ones. And that's how we kind of um, projected them in the course and tell everybody um, to, uh, to be mindful of biases and stereotypes that come into play. Um, and then uh, whether or not criminal justice system is the actual proper, proper way uh, through transparency, making sure that it's, it's um, laid out for them very clearly what their choices are so that they can make an informed decision, whether it be the criminal justice system, possibly getting help, maybe just speaking with the offender, engaging some safety uh, steps in place in the home, um, things like that. So, uh, and then as well, the officers, investigators are mindful of the victim bill of rights. In Ontario, we have two victim bill of rights, is the federal and the provincial. And in that, we teach that the most important one is understanding that the victim, should they provide a formal statement, has the choice for a male or a female interviewer. And that's any victim, that's not just our, our aging population, it definitely can be anyone. So recognizing the Victim Bill of Rights and making sure we know that. And um, as police officers, we know accused rights and sometimes we forget about the victim rights. So just being as an investigator, these are considerations they have to take into account at the onset of their investigation. So then it comes to the interview considerations. Um, and so this even goes right down to the setup of your interview. This is a formal interview that would take place and it would go right down to the setup of the room. So the officers will consider whether or not do they have a soft speaker? Where is the microphone in the room? Do we have to move them closer to that? Um, is it best to bring them to the police station or can we facilitate an interview being done in their home? Uh, we do have mobile cameras that we can bring out uh, as well as audio sticks for backup should there be any technological issue, but we have those in place to be able to accommodate that victim and, and make them the most comfortable to provide a good statement. Um, definitely for the aging population, cognitive awareness, the Supreme Court uh, case law and admissibility of a statement really has to be um, proven for the uh, the elderly and just making if you ask the question at the end of the statement where we say you know at the end how has this really affected your life and seeing them articulate that and talk through it can kind of help understand their cognition and um and also as well those interviews can also show evidence to their vulnerabilities as well so um just being mindful of admissibility of the statement and uh being able to make sure that the, co the cognitive awareness is, is addressed in that interview. Um, we tell the officers obviously to be very mindful of washroom breaks, transparency, 
transparency, transparency. Can't preach it enough in that people need to know the process. They don't know how the police work. They don't know the system. They don't know their options. And so talking about it, giving them time to think about it, speak with their loved ones about it um, helps. And then also um, just being mindful of things that they may need, such as frequent washroom breaks during that interview or breaks, water, um, just uh, being able to also engage them in it, um, sensory uh, awareness to be able to get their memory maybe to work a little bit better, uh, that type of thing. Um, the other thing that we have too, which is in there, it says communication intermediary. There's a Communications Disability Access Canada. That is their name. Uh, they um, provide access to justice for Ontarians. Um, I don't know about other provinces, but be something maybe to look into. And it's for anyone who has a communication disability. And so for that, what they do is they will um, they have speech pathologists and specialists on call that they will call and um, come to assist police uh, or anyone who really needs to communicate with a victim uh, to, to be able to communicate and understand what's going on. We know that victims with communication um, uh, issues or, or restraints definitely become victims two to three times more, um, a victim of crime likely. So we have to make sure we can understand and get their information from them. And um, I've had the um, benefit of having seen a communication communication intermediary work, speech pathologist work with an investigator during an interview of a um, young woman with cerebral palsy. And the officers were hesitant at first, but what I like to explain is that it was interesting to see how that communication intermediary was not teaching the victim how to communicate or was not being the interpreter or translator. It was more so teaching that officer how to understand and communicate with that victim. And to see that and understand, okay, for the first hour here, we're just gonna get you to understand what this person is trying to tell you. Um, and seeing how that worked was just amazing. Um, it worked very, very well. And the investigator came out of that just baffled by how effective it was to be able to get to uh, understand better what it was exactly that happened. Um, and so they don't become a chain of the evidence, part of the chain of evidence by any means. They're there for the onset of it, and then they uh, will excuse themselves. So uh, they're also available for when it comes time to testify in court as well. The court system here in Ontario will use um, them uh, if they need to, to have them testify. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a great resource. I can't say it enough having seen it firsthand. So. Um, okay, so this is just the criminal justice process. Uh, the police investigation shows a really nice clear picture of how things work and the process and steps that are taken. We do have this in um, uh, available to victims. Officers, some of them have this copy and they'll provide it and walk through it as a way or guide to show them the system and see if it's the right option for them. And then the ones that are off to the side there, that's the supports that are external to police. So the victim services I talked about right from the get-go from the police investigation. And then uh, the come court appearance time, the victim witness assistance program, which Karen spoke about as well, and how they assist. Um, so the victim um, witness assistance program, they're there to mitigate the distress that victims experience during the criminal court proceedings and also to facilitate the communication between the Crown Attorney and other criminal justice partners. Um, they do courtroom orientation. They'll bring, you know, if they have to, they'll bring the victim in if they'd like beforehand when the courtroom is completely empty. I don't know if many of you have presented before, but just seeing the room you're going to present in kind of puts you at ease, and that's the idea of that. Um, they provide them as much information and, again, transparency about the criminal justice process. And then if, if it were to come to a... Um, conviction or a plea, they would also assist them in the victim impact statement. And that's where the victim become, is allowed to have a voice in court and provide um, their impact emotionally, financially, every which way, and be able to communicate that to the court and to the judge so that it'll take, they'll take it into account for the sentencing. And uh, it's the best way to give a victim a voice in court um, full circle for the criminal justice process. And they're the ones, the victim witness assistance program that help them with that. So um, that's essentially the wraparound of how police respond and the things that we take into consideration when we respond to the aging population and vulnerable victims. Um, and I hope you've learned something from that. I'm going to, uh, I, I've never done one of these webinars before, so I have some special uh, technology here. So if anyone has a question, you can put your finger right there on the screen. Oh, gotcha. 
<laughs> um, but thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And uh, that concludes our portion of the uh, presentation. Benedict, over to you. Do I have to share this back with you? Um, no, I'll just uh, should be able to take it back. Perfect. That was amazing. Thank you so much to both, all three of you. Um, and you can stay on the on camera if you want, because I think we have a few questions um, sure. coming up. So there's actually a, one question. Let me just get back to it right now, which is a three-parter. So get ready. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Gina is asking. Let me get to the full question. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Uh, Sorry, there's been actually quite a few asked while you were speaking, which is great. Okay, so here's the question. It's actually a, a situation that happened uh, recently for for the uh, our participant. A client, I really want to speak French to you today. A client has shared their experience um, where they were victim blamed. Um, they experienced victim blaming from the officers who responded to their call. Who would the senior make a complaint to, not to get the officer in trouble? Uh, but rather to make sure that they get educated on how to deal with trauma. That's the first part of the question. I'll let you maybe start with that. Is that in Ontario, Benedict, you know, or? Uh, we can ask uh, oh, Gina about it. Yes, yes it is. Well, because then, uh, then I'm, I'm taking that personally. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> So you've just reported it. No, um, in all seriousness, yes. We are still seeing a lot of victim blaming, unfortunately. We're really trying to get the messaging out there. Uh, but unfortunately, we are still seeing some victim blaming. Um, I would call the local, I mean, I would call, is it, it's hard to say, is it a, a do we know a police service? I would just call the police service and ask to speak to a supervisor. Would you know yeah. different? Yeah, I mean, I mean the way PRD too. Yeah, there's lots of routes in Ontario to uh, if you have an issue with how the police investigation was handled, for sure, I would uh, seek out the supervisor to begin with and have a con conversation about what it was exactly in the language that was used. Um, and if uh, you know they need a support person to do that, I would hope there would be somebody available to do that with them. And then also, if they don't appreciate that response, then definitely the OIPRD, that's the acronym, Office of the Independent Police Review, don't have the last acronym, um, but <laughs> it is a uh, external entity that do um, in, uh, complaints, investigations against any uh, police uh, uh, service, actually. So um, that's yeah. one route. And I would say if it's OPP, uh please email me yes email or us call sure. me or let tracy and i know and we can deal with it directly yeah. that's Absolutely. great thank you and the, the the second part of the question was um can this be can the person voice her concern even if that happened over a year ago oh absolutely definitely yeah. no yeah, yeah. Limitation yeah. whatsoever um yeah and another thing too uh, um, there is the the office of the victim you spoke about that in the right. project work benedict that they're doing i know they have a forum to uh for a remedy if victims who feel that their rights have been breached or anything like that they can um put a complaint through that process as well so just that would be ombudsman the federal or ombudsman. Ombudsman. Yep. 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 but yeah please we we all we really do want to know this stuff because we really want to make that you know, make it better yeah for sure Okay, and part three of the question, which the follow-up sort of was, uh, it was actually two male officers who were dispatched, and the the older person was not given the option to have a female um, officer to speak to. Is the public supposed to, or how can you make the, the 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 public aware that they can ask for a female officer, or you know, is it the 911 dispatcher role to mention this? How does that work? So really, it's. I mean, the victim, we were pushing it now on officers to provide that option. Uh, there's nothing in the Victim Bill of Rights to say that we shall type of thing. It's their choice. Uh, but yeah, awareness is needed for the victim, for sure, to be able to get that out there. Um, we are with our officers. There's, uh, yeah, I, I know victim services are very aware of rights of victims, and they also um, communicate that to any victims that are referred to them. Um, but yeah, awareness is definitely needed. Yeah, but please ask if, you know, I encourage everybody to ask the officer 
um, or and if they don't get an answer, ask for the supervisor because that is their right to. Yeah, and don't be scared yeah. if you're if you're someone that's that's, that's 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 looking on. If you're an onlooker for the situation yeah. and you see that, don't be scared to go up to the male officers and say, "Listen, you know, I think if just so you know, I think she would probably be much more comfortable, yeah. or he would be more comfortable with, you know, a female or, or whichever the case may be, gender. Um, but uh, definitely don't be scared to speak yeah. up and, and step in. Um, you know, that's their right and you're just standing up for them, so that's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have a question from Renee, who is asking um, if she can have the, the, what was the name of the um, communications intermediary agency that you mentioned before? Hang on one sec. <laughs> <laughs> I should have put it in the slide and then everybody could have seen it and had it. Um, so they are called the Communication Disabilities Access Canada and um, it's separate, it's a national, so it's national non-for-profit organization who promotes social justice and access, accessibility and inclusion for people with communication disabilities and they are used by the Ministry of Attorney General, so they're approved for that for the use in courtroom and we have just started using them for police investigations and interviews as well. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Emily, who is asking what the conviction rate was for the study of the 16,000 cases you mentioned or at the start of your presentation. You know what, I can't say, I, our OPP, actually OPP conviction rate was higher than the national average. Um, I just want to see if I wrote it down, because I think it was about, ugh, I'd have to get back on that, I'm pretty sure it was about 40%, which isn't high um do you know offhand i can't i can't i think it was uh, i think it was about 40 percent, and yet we were higher than most police agencies but i can um again email that information to anybody just i just don't want to give misinformation so if anybody has a question please feel free to directly contact me but i think it was right around the 40 or 42 percent which is not high we get that thank you uh, do we have any other questions right now? We don't. Um, I had a few. Let me just find my notes. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, older victims, do you currently have any statistics uh, for the percentage of older victims that are reporting and that are being supported by the unit? Um, so I, can, I know for sure for Central Region in Ontario that um, that the percentage of victims in that age category are not as high as the children in uh, zero to 18. That is definitely our high category for victims of sexual assault. Uh, then next would be the adult range and then it's actually seniors. I, I can tell you that um, through just internally here in Central Region that we did, we have seen a spike um, with uh, victims from long-term care homes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there has been an increase in that and so uh, which is why we have Laura Proctor on our review committee for those cases that we review that involve um, the aging population and uh, vulnerable persons and long-term care home in particular uh, where there's those types of facilities where these assaults are occurring to help us through that uh, and realize how we can best come to a lasting solution for that victim in that circumstance and um, I know the Ministry of Long-Term Care Home is um, aware as well. I've spoken with them, so we're trying to engage with them as well to try and uh, figure out how to uh, to get awareness, education to the seniors in the homes. Yeah, and right. I just want to say too, if there's any statistics that anybody's interested in, please just reach out to me. We have a great analyst who uh, who's a real real guru yeah when it comes to stats so if there's anything that anything you can think of we'll try and pull it for you if you're interested in that oh that's that's great thank you um well while people are thinking we still have a few more minutes i had another one because in one of your uh, later slides you mentioned um question or considering whether the criminal justice system is the better option for every individual um so what would be, you, you kind of mentioned a few other options, but so what happens then if they decide not to go through with the process? Uh, is, are you still involved? Is there a follow-up? What's, how are they 
kind of taken from talking to you to then the other options and the next steps? Right. So um, the frontline officer response I was talking about is where that conversation will occur. And then likely again, if they do still want to proceed with the criminal justice system, they'll have an investigator um, also have that conversation with them. The options, um, it's a good question, uh, are many. I mean, they can ask for just police to speak with the offender uh, and make sure they're aware that their their action was unwanted and what they did was a criminal offense and bring it to their, their awareness. Um, and in that circumstance too, it's not that we just do that and leave and walk away. That information is still gathered. We, we keep that information um, for potential other uh, crimes that the offender may commit to be able to understand the behaviors of it as well. Um, lots of information is gathered from that um, co uh, complaint. I want, I want to call it a complaint, but that report. And, uh, and it, it's, it's definitely of value to us. If they choose still not to go with the criminal justice system, um, they very well, very well may not want anyone spoken to and nobody involved in it. And then we also then discuss that should something happen down the road and we, again um, we can still proceed with this offense that's been committed against you so we need to get a wholesome investigation um, but we definitely respect the rights of the victim and their choice and we make sure the important part with sexual violence because it is a power and control situation we make sure we give them the power and the control and we give them the information to make the mess the, the best informed decision for them in their circumstance so i hope that helps Yes, great, thank you. Okay, let's see, do we have, oh, there we go, we have another question from Gina. Um, if someone wanted to get a restraining order against an abuser, would the victim need to see the abuser in court to attain the restraining order? Um, no. <laughs> Actually, Tracy needs some water. <laughs> uh, no, you can, uh, well, it, I, I'm not sure if it's um, the same across Canada, I would think so, but you can just go to a, a Justice of the Peace, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tracy, because I'm not front line anymore, but you can go to a Justice of the a Peace and tell them you want a restraining order, and you give them the reasons why, and they will issue a, a restraining order against that person. I know you don't have to see them in court. No. Yes. Okay. And in terms of one thing I was wondering is, uh, let's say you're working for um, a senior center or just a, a senior service provider of any kind, um, and maybe you've heard this webinar today and you would like to bring in someone to talk, to do a presentation or to kind of, you know, kind of bring up, if not the detailed topic, just a few, uh, kind of throw a few lines there of information of awareness. Is that something that's doable, that's possible? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a, an abuse coordinator for every region uh, in the OPP, it's Sergeant um, Leslie Raymond, who works with me, and she is very well um, engaged with the local uh, seniors advocacy groups and committees, and uh, they write grants for such things as that, education, awareness, and she's engaged with that as well. And so we have police as a part of that committee, and um, you can reach out to any, any of those services in your area and have a presentation, I'm, I'm sure. And, or and reach out to us too, us if you can't, well. yeah, if there's something specific, reach out. Because we also have, um, we have a section in our organization, Community Safety Services, that also does a lot of prevention and education. They're not so much investigative, but they do offer a lot of prevention tips and guides, and they have a lot of good resources too. So yes. we, can, we can share that as well. And, and if I could just, website, uh, if I could just jump in, yeah. uh, of course, at Elder Abuse Prevention, our core mandate is providing that key training and education. Yeah. Uh, Tracy mentioned Leslie Raymond, and um, I know her very well, and we've tag teamed a lot um, with different police agencies across the province. So if anyone uh, wants a wants to see a collaborative approach to that presenting uh, with Elder Abuse Ontario and either municipal police or OPP, we're always willing to um, to make that available to any senior center that may need it. And that's free too, that doesn't, that's at no, no cost yep. to, uh, to anybody, that's yeah. free of charge. That's great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for uh, <laughs> popping in. Um, <laughs> I, is, that's the thing. I know Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario does these things, but I forget not everyone does. Exactly. <laughs> so, thanks for bringing it up. 
Um, I think, oh, no, we, we have just one more question, which I think is still kind of a follow-up from Gina's earlier questions. Uh, what happens if someone makes a complaint to a supervisor? Does it go documented? What happens next? So supervisor, Laura, do you want to speak to that? No, or, I'm in the oh, situation. Oh, the complaint part. Okay, yeah. sorry, just listen. Yeah, usually they're documented um, um, and, and oftentimes, um they are sent on specific training if it's a, if it's a training issue um, but they are spoken to and documented about their actions yeah i guess part of the whole review is that we've looked in, internally and recognized there's some gaps mm -hmm. and so we want to make that better so when those types of things come up yeah we, we're definitely working on performance improvement and really great investigative excellence and so yeah it's it's not just a negative documentation yeah. we follow up with this is why and this is and, and educate them so we really need officers tools and i think we've fallen a bit short on that um, just because of officer turnaround so we're really working with all the police to get like the ontario police academy our own police academy um, to bring all of the standards up to you know that trauma-informed approach so a lot of officers, some officers don't even know it exists yet. So it's really trying to get that, you know, that messaging out there as well. So, but they will be spoken to for sure. Yeah. And the review committee, Karen spoke about when there's cases that come up that could have very well, what you said, some victim blaming language, really good educational um, uh, point, then we meet and debrief with that yeah. officer. And I can tell you firsthand, because I've done it lots of times, they don't even recognize it in themselves um a lot of the time we point out the biases or like you said the victim blaming language that comes out through that and uh it's an awareness and they they're actually very receptive so it's yeah. been it's been positive that way and i'm glad we have that ability to do it it's good thank you well we've just uh it is 11 i'm afraid of 11 my time uh, over here on the west coast so um i'll let you off the hook today thank you so much to all three of you uh for participating for everyone else um a reminder you can find you'll be able to find the slides attached to um this training right now they will also be put on our website cnpa.ca this afternoon the recording will go up as well and will be emailed to you, so don't worry about it. One way or another, it, it will find its way to you. Um, if you have questions for me, my uh, email address is visible on the screen right now. Uh, for those of you who ask questions or uh, additional information, I will connect you with Karen and Tracy. Um, don't forget to check out uh, Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario's website as well uh, or on social media. They have tremendous resources and staff uh, experts who can provide with you with all the uh, support that you need and the information that you need. And thank you all for being so engaged and asking all great questions. We'll uh, hopefully see you soon for our next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks.